thanks, Ryan. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Daniel Patterson. Um, I'm one of the members of Position Development. Um, we're a worker-run software development company here in New York. We actually work in Brooklyn. But um, uh, we do uh, sort of contract work, um, mostly sort of in the independent publishing sphere, but a little bit here and there. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is sort of following on um, what Libby was talking about and a little bit how some of this stuff works. And I think the question that uh, you asked about, but aren't these types different is sort of um, the point um, and sort of how that works and how it makes sense. And, and I think the goal is to make it so that you can apply this in other realms. Like if you find a problem where you're like, oh, I'd really like to have that kind of stuff. I'm hoping to give you the tools to do that. Um, so just as a summary is like a little, um, and I'm sorry the font is totally ugly. I had computer switches. Um, but uh, as a review, um, this is sort of what uh, an, some of an application um, is. And I think the thing I want to highlight is what you had noticed, that the first route matches that there's nothing left. And obviously, there might be still query parameters, but the actual um, formal parts of the um, path you've gotten to the end, and that'll match the index handler. And the index handler takes this context that might be a database connection or whatever else, but that's it. And then it turns gives you back a response. Um, and the maybe parts are that it could decide, actually, I don't have anything for you, and it'll keep routing. Um, but the other two paths um, need things. Um, the first is saying, uh, you know, give me two parts, and, and I expect that they will be integers. If they're not integers, this won't match. Um, and the handler function you know, says, oh, look, these are integers, and you have actual arguments. And so um, you're not looking things up, or there's not sort of a map floating around. They're actually honest to goodness, you know, arguments. Um, and so if I want to just as a little experiment and say, well, how would we try to do this um, sort of without any of the stuff that the rest of the talk is going to be on? Can everyone hear me? Good. OK, cool. Um, and so there's some, probably some data structure that represents what one of these parts of the URL, what part, one of these patterns might look like. Um, so there's, you know, constant, just like a piece of text that maybe you'd match, and maybe there's a, a pat part that you actually want to extract out, which I've been using the term segment, um, and maybe there's a query parameter that you want, and maybe you want to match on it being finished um, for end. And so the pattern itself would be just a list of those, and we then make this function that takes a pattern and a handler that matches. And at some point, we're going to need to get a URL or a request or whatever. Um, and then somehow we have to produce a response. Um, and so the question is, what is the type of this arrow function? Um, and it sort of seems like, well, it takes a pattern, and it takes a handler function, and it takes a URL, and then it produces a response. And maybe there's you know IO or other things. Um, but, oh, the font. Uh, I'm sorry, all of the highlighting is going to be a little bit off because um, the font's different. But um, uh, it's a little bit, it's close to the handler um, is sort of the thing I want to focus on because that's actually a function of potentially many arguments. Um, and it might have none, you know, it might be just a um, response. In the case of the index handler, there was nothing else. Um, but it might take integers, it might take, you know, text, it might take other things. Um, and so that is a function of, um, potentially many arguments, um, and it varies. Um, and that's a problem because it has to match against how many, um, not actually the, um, I'm simplifying a little bit here, if you think that every single one of those parameters was a segment, was actually matching part of it, then the length of that list, which is a value, has to be equal to the number of arguments to the handler function. So those n, those two n's, pn and uh, tn, the n there has to be the same. Um, and so sort of the type of the handler, in, in some sense, is depending on the value of this pattern. Um, and that should be sort of a, a little bit of an alarm bell um, that goes off if you're, uh, it might not strike you as strange if you're coming from a language like JavaScript or Ruby or something, where you can easily do this kind of thing. Um, but normally, that's pretty hard to do um, in Haskell. Um, and uh, sorry, the, um, <laughs> the way that it's going to work is sort of to leverage two things. One are continuations, which was in the title of the talk, um, and the other is polymorphism. Um, and as a review, um, if you uh, 
haven't seen much of what polymorphism is, um, in particular, there's certain ways you want to think about it. The idea is you have some um, function that you wrote that was just for integers to take an integer and give back an integer. Um, that's the one on the, the left. And on the right, we wrote the same function for strings. Um, and the idea is, well, do we really have to keep writing these functions? Um, the answer in some languages is no. Um, we can write a function that says, given whatever the input type is, some a, the output will be the same type. Um, and the important part here is that when you call it with 10, say that's an integer, what the compiler is doing, or what the type checker is doing, is figuring out that a must be an integer. And it's figuring that out because the argument is an integer. And since the argument is, has type a, it knows it has to get the same a as an output. So the output is an integer too. Um, and so in the second case, when you pass it with a string, it says, oh, well, a must be a string because I know my argument has type a and my argument is a string. Um, and so the, the term for what's happening there is the type variables are getting instantiated with concrete types. Um, and that's sort of how polymorphism works. Um, and so the, the sort of the topic of the talk or continuations or how, to, how type dependency, and I want to put that in quotes because it's not really um, dependent types, but it's a little bit of something with plain old polymorphism, um, the kind that uh, you can see in sort of any ML-like language. There's, no, there's not going to be any um, sort of GHC or even Haskell specific stuff here. Um, and so what continuations are is if you have some function Say this is an add function, it takes two numbers and has them, gives you back the sum. The idea behind continuations are that instead of actually returning values, you have a function that does something, and normally it returns some value. Instead of doing that, what we're going to do instead is take another argument that says what to do with the value. And instead of ever returning, we're instead just going to pass the result to the continuation. And so what happens to this add function is it takes another argument, this first argument, which I'm going to call k, and k is used um, very frequently in these kind of things to indicate continuation. I don't know why it's not c. Um, and what that k is, it says, well, I take an integer and I return something. But the person writing this, add, add k function, doesn't know how it's going to be used, doesn't know what that continuation is going to be, and so doesn't know the ultimate return type. Because the return type of this add k function is whatever the continuation returns. And so we can use this in a bunch of different ways. Um, in particular, we can sort of recover our normal add function just by passing the identity function. Saying the continuation doesn't do anything, it just returns the value. We could also say, oh, we want to print this out. So we pass a print function in. And then we get this function int int io. And we can use it in any different number of ways. Um, and the idea is you're sort of separating what actually gets done from the operation that's happening right here. So addition is what's happening, but you don't know what's eventually going to happen after. Um, any questions so far? Um, I think in general, if you have like clarification questions or anything about what I've said, please bring it up. If you have larger questions, we'll, we can talk about them at the end. Um, and so what I'm actually going to talk about for this talk um, is a sort of related problem to this routing problem, um, and that's printf. Um, and printf, if you've seen it from um, languages that have it, um, is a function that takes some format string, and then it takes some number of arguments, and it prints it out. I'm writing this with Haskell's types. Um, and the idea is the format string is some specification of some text, some sort of like the, the um, constant part of it, and there's some holes that get filled in. And so percent %s is going to be filled in with a string, and percent %d is for an integer. Um, and so the idea, oh my gosh. Uh, um, <laughs> the idea is that the number and the types of arguments match what's in that pattern, what's in that format. So there's a string because there's a percent %s, and there's an integer because there's a percent %d. Um, and that's similar to what's happening with this routing function, where the pattern, um, I don't know why I wrote route, but really the pattern has to match the number of types, the number of arguments and the types of the handler function. So you get a sort of analogous problem where you have this format string that then is supposed to impact the number of arguments that you get um, in the, the rest of it. Um, and so what we're going to do for printf um, 
is, oh, an indentation is also messed up. Okay, um, so I, my apologies. Uh, I guess this is not a fixed font anymore. Um, so build up uh, these strings um, out of, the format strings are gonna be built out of combinators. If you wanted to actually write a string, you would need dependent types or something else. Maybe uh, you could do it with some kind of compile time thing, a macro or a template Haskell or something. But um, we're staying within sort of the realm of, we're just dealing with polymorphism and normal functions. Um, and so we're gonna build up this format string out of uh, little combinators. So C is one that takes a constant, just a piece of text that'll be a constant. Um, S is gonna take a string and D is gonna take an integer. And this is supposed to be sort of analogous to how printf works. Um, and so that first um, function, or this is what they print out. So the first one inserts there into where the S is and 10 into where the D is. Um, and so when you apply printf to C of high percent S percent C of comma percent D, that gives you back a string to int IO function. And when you apply it to just foo, C of foo percent D, that gives you an int IO function. Um, and the goal of the talk is that not only will this make total sense, but hopefully you can do this yourself. Um, it's a kind of fun, fun thing to build. Um, and polymorphism and continuation sort of melded together are what are gonna make this work. I guess I should have said, there are tons of uses to, for continuations. They're a really cool topic. Um, they're used for control flow stuff. They're used for performance reasons. They're used um, for any number of different things. Um, I'm using them here really to get this sort of like cheap type dependency. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, so getting to sort of getting into the details of printf, um, the idea is that the format, we're thinking about continuation is the format, whatever the result is, is gonna take in a continuation that says what to do. And what we do at the end is we print it out to the screen. So all that printf does is pass in put sterlin, which is, um, if you're new to Haskell, um, I'm sorry uh, for the rest of the talk, but if you're new to Haskell, uh, put sterlin is print a string and then add a new line. Um, and so that's, that's all that printf does. That's the full definition. Um, the type, um, sort of a, a intro to how some of these continuation types work, uh, they're a little bit tricky and uh, we'll sort of get to points where the types may be less helpful than just thinking about the values, um, which is a little weird for Haskell. But, um, the idea we can see is that printf takes in this format, which is this whole first argument. Oh, I guess I have a light. This whole first thing is the format. And then what it does is it's gonna pass the format. It's gonna pass put sterlin to the format. So the format must take as its first argument a string dio function, because that's what put sterlin is. And what the format's gonna return once you apply that function, we don't know. It's just A, but whatever that is, is gonna be what printf returns. Um, and these highlighting are gonna be useless, um, so I can use the laser. Um, so the idea is that a, this A and this A, and this A is from the format, and that A is the output. Um, those must be the same. And that is sort of how we, we tie these, um, the formats to the way with it we produce multi-argument functions. And in particular, in the example we had at the beginning with these identity functions, we only ever instantiated the type variables with types like integers or strings. Um, but there's no reason we can't have those be function types. The, the polymorphism works fine when the uh, type variables get instantiated that way. So in particular, if we instantiate this as IO, then once we apply the format, we just get back an IO action and it's just gonna print to the screen. So that would be the equivalent of just printing out a constant. Um, but we could also get a string IO function back, and that would be it expects one more string, it's gonna insert it somehow and then print it out. We could get a string to end, we could get you know, any number of different things. However many times you wanna combine these things, you'll get a bigger and bigger function back. Um, so we're gonna start with C, um, which from the, um, uh, from the examples in the beginning, this is just constant strings. Um, you might be able to pull off something with overloaded strings, I don't know. Um, but this is how you use it. Um, so printf of some constant string just prints out the string, um, nothing else to it. Um, and so we know from the beginning that printf has this type. Um, so we wanna try to use that to help us figure out, um, I don't know what that is, uh, what, how C works. Um, and so we know that C 
Um, that almost worked. Um, C is applied to some string. That's hello there. And whatever it returns after applying to that string, that is what this yellow box is down here. Right? That's the return type. That's also going to be the type of what's passed to printf. And that is supposed to be just this part. Right? That's the part that the first argument to printf is the result when we apply a string to C. Um, and so we could say, OK, well, we know it's sort of supposed to be a string to IO to something. And we know constants are just, you know, we know what's going to happen with printf is it's going to pass put sterlin in. So the, for, the argument here is going to be put sterlin. And then we're going to apply it to our string and print it out. So we get back IO. Um, this isn't actually good enough. Um, it's appealing. Um, but what I want to get to is saying, well, this is a particular continuation. This is a continuation that can do I.O. So it takes a string in, and it does can do I.O. with it. And then you apply it, and you get back I.O. Whereas if we change the type to this, the continuation that we get in, this first argument, can do anything. It can do I.O. if it wants. B is, you know, B could be I.O. Um, but there's no real restriction of what it can do. Um, and so it's actually going to be the type we're going to use for C. Um, and so to implement this, we sort of have some idea of what the type should be, um, which is this. And we know we get this argument, this constant string. That's what we're going to format. Um, and so looking at the type, we're supposed to produce a function, right? So and it looks like it takes as this argument a continuation, this form of you know the value to then something. So we're going to say, OK, our first argument is this continuation. And so if we think a little bit about this and look at this and say, well, k is a string to b function. What we're supposed to produce is a b. We have a string to b, and then we have this string. So can we, apply, can we just apply it? Um, and that's, that's the definition. So we just take the continuation, pass the constant string to it, and we're done. Um, any questions? Sorry. OK. Um, and so we can sort of walk through the types and see how this makes sense in, in a concrete example. Um, and so we know that printf had this type. All right, we'll see this. Um, Hello? OK. Um, and we're passing it. We're going to pass it just this constant hello, hello there string. Um, and we know this is the pattern. That's the first argument. So whatever it's going to return back is some A. So we know this whole thing sort of has this type A. But we want that A to be I.O., right? We want to be done. We want when we call printf of C of hello there, that should be it should just print it to the string, and we should be finished. Um, and so why is that? Um, so printf expects this string to IO to A as its argument. That's what we said. And hello there, C of hello there, has a string to B to B type. right? Once we've applied the constant, that's this argument, we get back this thing. So we sort of have to figure out, and this is what that instantiation process we were talking about right at the beginning of figuring out how to what these type variables are. Um, and they have to, these types have to match. If they're not the same, it's going to be a type error. It's going to say, I expected this, but you gave me this instead. But as long as we can figure out an A and a B that make them match, then that's fine. The compiler is happy. Um, and so in particular, string and string, that match is fine. This is an arrow, and that's an arrow. That's good. So those match. This is the first place where we're saying, oh, huh, what about these two things? And the high line is wrong. Um, IO should match with B. And so B is equal to IO, IO unit. Um, that's what this type variable B is. And at the same time, we also want A to match with B. And so we know A, A must equal B. And if we put those two facts together, we get that A has to be equal to IO, which, if you go back above, was exactly what we wanted. I'm um, sorry, it's a little too fast. Um, go back. Oops. Um, <laughs> let's try it once more. Um, 
Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so to actually use this to sort of see, um, I've hopefully convinced you that the types work out, but we haven't actually seen that it actually does what, what we expect it to do. And, and obviously we hope that if the types make sense that it actually prints this string out, but it's probably good to see that that happens. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is um, sort of expand out, go step by step um, through the evaluation. Uh, I'm not actually trying to make this be in the order um, that Haskell will do it, um, but uh, it should be equivalent. Um, and so we're given this printf, see if hello there, and so we know the definition of printf, that was just take the format and pass put sterling to it. So we can expand that to that, That's sort of our next step. Um, and we know what C was, we wrote it, so we can expand out what the definition of C is. Um, and that was this, it takes, and I'm, before I'd written it with pattern matching, um, but to have it in line here, it takes some constant string and then it takes a continuation and then it passes the string to the continuation. So that's C and the rest is unchanged. Um, and so now we have a function here applied to a value. So we can, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> we can um, pass, you know, apply it and then hello world becomes where stir is um, because that's the argument. So we just replace it in the body and we get this. That's sort of the next step. Um, and at this point we have a function that takes a k argument applied to a value, which is put sterling. So again, k can be replaced with put sterling and we get put sterling hello world, which is what we want. Um, so hopefully this sort of convinces you that everything we've done so far, type, types match up, uh, values work, it, it runs, it'll print out um, what it says. Um, so the next step is, because uh, constants are sort of the easiest case, um, is to talk about integers, um, integer formatting. And so the idea behind printf of d is then it's a function that takes an integer um, and prints it to the stream. And so I'm putting again the type of printf here um, sort of for review and because we'll use it. Um, and so that's supposed to be highlighting the d um, and it's supposed to only be highlighting the format. Um, so the idea is that, well, D has to match against this thing. We know that because that's the, the first argument uh, for printf. And so we're going to do it a little differently. And instead of trying to work out what the types are, we're just going to take our C and try to change it a little bit, think about it, and see if we can turn it into a D. Um, and so in particular, we have this pattern of we accept a continuation. Continuations where the value eventually is going to go. That's the whole pattern for continuations always. Um, and so eventually we're going to pass it. We're going to call it with some value and we think we're going to have an integer at some point because that's the whole idea. And we're going to turn it into a string with show and then we're going to pass it to k. Um, so sort of the question is where does that integer come from? Um, and just to sort of review, put these up again. So printf of d should be an int to io function. That's the idea. Um, and we think maybe the body, the implementation looks something like that. Um, and so if we try to learn a little bit from how C worked, if we review a little bit of that, um, this is where we're actually using it, the first line. And this is the type of just the format when we've applied C with hello there. And this is what the implementation of the body looks like for C. Um, and what I want to be highlighting <laughs> is that this return type, this IO unit for printf, thinking about how we get there, well, printf is going to pass put sterlin to this thing. So put sterlin is going to be this string to b, and so the b is going to be what the return type is here. And we figured that out at the beginning. We, we instantiated b with IO unit in this exact example. So IO unit is the same as B. And then if we look down here, the body of C, the implementation, is this K to B function, where the B is this K of stir. So we, and we use that, we also figured that out. We were saying we need to produce a B. How do we produce a B? Well, we have this K, which is a string to B function, and we have a string so we can get a B from that. And so if these are all the same, what we want is instead of this, of this IO unit, we want an int IO unit. That was the problem um, 
first place. And so maybe we can just change the bottom, right? If we can change this to instead of just being a, a B or an IO unit, if it was an integer to IO unit, um, and we get this. So the, what we've replaced in these dot, dot, dots is a function from an integer to that. And that's where the int comes from. Um, and that works. Um, so how do we use it? Um, well, and this I'm sort of going to expand out the same way, this like looking how the steps work to convince you that this does the right thing. Um, printf, we know, takes its format and passes put sterlint to it. And it's important here to note that you might have thought that the put sterlint would be at the end. But printf took one argument and then passed put sterlint to that argument. What it returned was a polymorphic variable that maybe a later is instantiated to a multi-argument function. So it, all it does is take its first argument and pass put sterlin to it. And you can sort of imagine that like this whole part, it doesn't care. That could have been missing and we could walk through this all the way down to getting an int IO function. And so the next step, um, sort of the only thing we can do is expand out the definition of D, see what we have there. Um, and we just wrote that, so that takes a continuation, and then it takes an integer, and then it turns the integer into a string and passes it to the continuation. And now, um, it's gonna be some more bad highlighting. Um, we have this function that takes an argument k, and it's applied to a value, put sterling. So we can replace k in the body with put sterling. So we get this. And then we now have again a function from one argument, takes an integer, and is applied to a value. So we can substitute that 10 for int in the body, and we get put sterling show of 10, um, which is what we wanted. So it does the right thing. Um, S is essentially the exact same thing as uh, D, it's just you just don't have to turn it into a string because it already is a string. Um, and as some examples, here's sort of what we've been able to do so far. Um, which is great, but if all we wanted to do was print out one value, um, there are a lot of easier ways to do that than all of that um, gymnastics. Um, so really the thing that we care about and the reason why this is interesting is combining them together. We want the formats to compose. Um, and so thinking in terms of the continuations, which is sort of the, the exercise of the whole idea is that we have a continuation is a function that takes as its first argument the place where the result will go, where the result of whatever that computation is. Um, and so we're gonna use this percent as the combine operator. It takes two formats, that's our input, and then it produces something in this continuation style. And K should be where it sends the combined formatted string, where it's done everything that F1 and F2 wanted it to do and it's finished, it has a string, sends it to K. Um, and so if we're thinking about what F1 and F2 are, they're also continuation style pieces. Um, they're building blocks that use continuation. So each of them takes as its first argument where to send the result when it's finished. And a format, we know what it does is it figures out how to format a string and that's the result. And so if we, um, if we, pass, we can use this format, this first format, by providing a continuation to it. And we can say, when you're finished, please send us your formatted string, which is S1. So you may have had to read in an integer, you may have had to read a string, you may have had to do a bunch of things, we don't know, but at some point you'll be finished. And when you're finished and you have a string and it's ready to go, please give it to us. And that's what we've, we provided the continuation. Um, and this is sort of the reason why this approach becomes really interesting and flexible is because you can uh, change sort of how you, where you're reasoning about when things happen. And so you can say, oh, sometime in the future, please give me the result. Um, and we can talk about using it right now, even though it won't be produced until later. Um, and so that's the string um, highlighting is supposed to be here. You've probably started to catch on. Um, and the same thing with uh, the second format. When we don't know what's gonna happen in between here, maybe some other stuff, I don't know. And we don't know what's gonna happen here. But we do know that these are ways we can use F1 and F2. Um, is that eventually they're gonna format some str a string 
and hand it to us. Um, and so we know that k, from up here we said, well, k is where the combined formatted string will go. Well, the combined output, once we have the two strings, is just putting them together. There's nothing else to do. Um, so we can actually write this as, okay, we'll take in the continuation, which is where everything will go. We'll take our first format, pass it a continuation of where it should send its result. Take the second format, pass its a continuation of where it should send the result. We'll append these two results together and we'll send them in k. Um, and this works. Uh, it might be a little surprising, it's very short. Um, we didn't have to do very much. We didn't talk about integers or strings or how many arguments or anything. Um, and so we should probably check, um, don't just trust me. Um, but so if we're thinking about what formats are, it's something like it accepts a continuation where to send the result. That's a string to a function. And it does something. <laughs> um, and we're not sure what exactly, because what it does, we have two examples so far, two concrete examples, and once we compose them, we should have bigger ones. Um, one, the constant just produced an A. All it did was uh, send the string to the continuation right away. The integer and the string ones both took an integer in before they produced the value, uh, or an integer and then a string. So this F bracket A is intended to communicate that depending on uh, which this is, there might be a different number of arguments here. Um, so that's why it's not, it doesn't work as a type. Um, sort of we get back to this, we want to treat uniformly functions of different number of arguments of different types, which we can't do. Um, at least not without sort of more type machinery than uh, is the topic of this talk. Um, and so the idea of percent is that it sort of takes two of these formats, and I'm changing the uh, type variable to make it clear there's no particular connection between this and this. They both look like this, but they might have different types. Uh, and then it should produce, because we want it to compose, it should produce something that looks similar, same pattern, something that accepts a continuation, and then maybe takes more arguments and eventually um, produces the result of the calling the continuation. Um, and so the way that we, uh, sort of getting back to um, polymorphism is that, um, uh, so I just, just moving to a new slide. So that's the implementation and that's the type we just wrote. Um, so the idea is that if we can figure out how to replace these F bracket types, which aren't real types, with type variables, that will eventually get instantiated into what the F bracket actually was, then it'll work. And, and that sort of lets us sidestep this issue of we actually want to write types of sort of var arg types um, in Haskell. Um, and uh, this is going to be painful. Um, so uh, just use more. Um, is the laser pointer doing OK to correct the highlighting? Um, OK. Uh, if you looked at the, if you downloaded the slides, um, they'll have all the highlighting, uh, not in steps, but all together. So, so, and you can look back at it later if that's helpful. Um, so the first thing I want to note is this K argument, this con the top level continuation. What we said is we're going to pass the end result to. That is this here. And that's because we took our two formats. That's format one, that's format two. And then we produce a function from a continuation, which is this to f of bracket c, which is sort of the rest of this. Um, and that's sort of a placeholder to sort of keep, keep straight where are these arguments coming from? Well, there are these first two lines, and where is this body coming from? Well, it's after here. Um, and this is sort of in the middle. Um, and so uh, I'm actually just going to stand here, because uh, it's not going to help. Um, so the idea. Um, is that we want to sort of think about how some of these types match up. Um, and so in particular, if we look at thinking about the first format, which is this first line, it is going to take a continuation, which is this whole thing. The whole rest of this line is that what's passed to F1. And it's going to produce F bracket A, whatever that is. So the result type of F1 applied to the rest of this line is this F bracket A. 
But the result type of this F1 applied to the rest of this line is the same thing as what this function produces once you hand it K, right? That's, the, that's what this whole thing is, is the result of F1 when you apply it. So this FA and FC have to be the same. Um, because if they weren't, it, wouldn't po it couldn't possibly type check because the body of the function here, right, the body of this arrow has to be whatever F1 returns when you apply it to the argument. So that's the first, these two things we're saying, those are equal. I mean, these were supposed to line up, but sorry. Um, similarly, we can say, well, F1, you're applying it, you know, this is its first argument. So the rest of this line, this S1 to et cetera, is this piece here, this string to A function. And so we know S1's a string. That's fine. We can read that off the type here. So then the body, once you pass it a string, this whole thing must be this A. Right? Whatever this body is, we've passed it a string, we get back an A. But that body, that whole thing, that A, must be the result of F2 when we've applied it, when we've passed it this continuation. And that's what this FB is, right? F2, once you've passed it, this continuation gives you back an FB. So this A and this FB must be the same. And we can do this one more time saying, let's step a, another level in and look at the continuation passed to F2 which is a string to B function. So we know S2 is a string. And so this whole body must be a B because we say we have a string to B function. But this whole body is the return type once we call K, once we pass K an argument. So K, which we start out with, K is a string to C. So the return type of K is C. So B and C must be the same. Um, and so we can rewrite this saying, OK, well, um, we knew that. Uh, a and FB had to be the same, so let's just call them both A. And we knew that B and C had to be the same, so let's call them both B. And since we've gotten rid of the Cs, we might as well reuse it by saying that F, and, F of A and F of C have to be the same, so we'll call them C. And so that's the type of those operation, the percent. Um, so that might seem a little bit hand wavy. Um, because I just sort of decided that I was going to you know, replace these things with type variables and it would work out. Um, so it'd probably be useful to check it um, and sort of see how an example, um, in particular, we're going to try D percent S. Um, I want to see how that, printf of that, has the type int to string to IO. Um, and because I think it's helpful to see all of this stuff, all the steps together, um, I'm sh shrinking string to stir on the slide. Um, just to make everything fit a little bit better. Um, so this percent thing we just wrote, this is just repeating the type we just saw, except for with that replacement, stir instead of string. So we're applying D and S. You know, it's an infix operator, so this is a D this, and this is S. So we know that D has to match with this first line. This is going to be D. And so what that means is that um, a has to match with F, right? Because stir to A has to match with stir to F. And similarly, C is whatever we get back when we pass this stir to A function, stir to F function. And so that's this whole int to F. So C must be equal to int to F. And so we can rewrite both those things. A is equal to F and C is equal to int to F. And we get a new type for what this particular instantiation of percent is. Um, and we can do the same thing with S um, and say, well, if stir to B to F has to match stir to G to stir to G, then stir matches stir, which is good. And then B must match G. Um, and <laughs> um, F then has to match whatever we get back, which is this function stir to G. So we know that F is now stir to G, and B is now G. So we rewrite this one more time. And this is starting to get pretty uh, big, but what we can remember is that we, we've sort of dealt with these first two arguments. We've already made the match. We don't care about them. What we care about is we get back, which is just the last line. So D percent S is just a stir to G to int to stir to G function, which is still a reasonably sized function, but it's a quite a bit smaller than that. And so printf 
from way back at our definition, we said was a stirred IO to A to A function. So we want to figure out how applying printf to this format gets you an int to stir to IO. Um, and so we do the same. This is this process of type variable instantiation. We have to figure out how to match, figure out how to solve for these variables. And stir matches stir, so that's great. And so then G must match IO, because those have to match. And then since printf gets this as its first argument, that's from here to here. So A must match the whole rest of this. So we get G is equal to IO, and A is stir to stir to G, which is then stir to stir, or into stir to IO, which is exactly what we wanted. We wanted, once we apply printf to this format, we want to get back an into string to IO function, which we do. So the types, the types at least line up. Um, but again, there's this question of, does it actually do what you want it to do? It's possible to write things that type check that don't work. Um, so I'm going to walk through the exact same example, um, but actually expanding out and, and sort of applying functions and replacing to get to hopefully the end result, which is going to be accepting an integer and a string 10 and high, concatenating them together and printing it out. Um, and so we know that printf um, is, uh, what it does is take its first argument and pass put Sterling to it. So we can do that. And then uh, I think I'm going to expand D, the definition of D, so we can see what to do next. Um, or sorry, that's ex expanding percent. Um, and we wrote that before. We had F1 and F2 before, but now they're uh, D and S. So, but this is this definition, it takes a continuation, that's where to send the combined formatted string, and then it applies the first format. So the first format will do whatever it needs to do, which hopefully will be accept an integer. And when it's done, it'll pass us a string, which is that integer formatted, hopefully. And then we call the second format, which is S, and when it's done, it should have an, a string for us, and then we're going to put them together with the append and pass them to K. Um, and so we have a function now um, that takes a continuation of k, a function, and it uh, is applied to this put Sterlin. It's applied to other things too, but in particular the first argument. So we can then substitute in, replace all the appearances of k within the body with put Sterlin, and we get to this. That's the next step. Um, and at this point, uh, there might be a couple things we could do. I think just, I just decided to expand out d the definition of D, which we wrote um, earlier, which was it takes a continuation, and then it gives back a function from an integer to applying the continuation to the formatted result. Um, and so if we think about that, we're applying this to this whole thing here. And this is, you know, we said from the beginning this was going to be a continuation that, that was passed to the first format. So this whole line is our k in this body. And so we can sort of substitute that in. And so we can see that this int is still here, right? And so in the body where we used to have k, we now have that whole thing. And then that's applied, k is applied to show of int. And we still have these other two arguments because we didn't touch that part. Um, and so that's the same step. I didn't do anything in between the slides, um, sort of to keep, uh, keep things square. Um, and what I'm going to do now, um, and I really apologize for the highlighting not lining up at all, um, is this is a function that's supposed to be where the formatted integer goes. And it's applied to show of int, which is the formatted integer. So we can apply that and replace everywhere we see S1 in the body with show of int. And so we get that. And there's a couple of different things we can do, but um, just sort of for illustrative purposes, I'm going to go next to expanding S, the definition of S, the string formatting function. Um, and so we get this from a continuation K to a function that accepts a string and then passes the string to the continuation. And again, this is applied to this whole line, which is a continuation. It's a function where you can pass a string to when you're ready. Um, and so we can substitute that in for K in the body and now we get this. Um, and so, just jumping to another slide, same thing, no changes. Um, and so now we have this function uh, here, which is taking S2, which if we remember was supposed to be the formatted 
string, the result from the second format, and it's applied to stir, which seems pretty good. Um, so we can then substitute that into the body, and we now we have an int to stir to put stirlin of show int plus plus stir, and it's applied to an integer and a string. So we apply it to the two arguments, and we get back put stirlin show of 10 plus plus high, um, which was the goal. Um, so obviously that was a lot, um, and as things get bigger, uh, you know, stepping through this uh, would become even more elaborate. Um, but hopefully that sort of starts to convince you that maybe this stuff um, does work. Um, and so that's the complete definition. That's all the code we wrote um, on one slide. That's a essentially functioning definition of printf. Um, that's a lot of stuff there. Um, but the, the nice thing is you actually don't, oh, the, the worst, uh, worst alignment failure ever. Anyway, the point is you don't have to write the types down. You can just write the bodies. Um, and type inference will figure it all out. Sort of one of the advantages of not using a lot of fancy type machinery is that inference works. And I mean, this works in, um, you can do this in OCaml. You can probably do this in F sharp. I'm not sure. Um, you can definitely do it in standard ML. Um, uh, and so, <laughs> so maybe the reason why you were curious about this first place was how FN routing um, works. Um, and so uh, instead of that, I'm just going to tell you a little bit of how it's different. Um, because for the most part, um, it's very similar. Um, it uses, it leverages all this stuff um, to sort of build up these format um, things that match against the handlers. Um, probably the, the most concrete difference, um, and the reason why I didn't want to use it as an example, is um, routes can fail to match. So there's always maybe values floating around there because maybe you didn't even match. Um, so, and then also handlers can say, because routing is nested, right, you can route to a handler that then does more routing, and any of those things could fail, or just the thing could, maybe the handler was, look up in the database, does this entry exist, because you're looking up by some integer ID, it doesn't exist, and you want to not continue routing. Um, so all of these things can fail, so there's a lot of maybes floating around, um, or at least two levels, and it just sort of complicates things, whereas printf is nice because, um, you, there's no sense of failure. Um, everything has to work out. Um, there's also requests threaded through um, because you know you're actually matching on parts of the URL or parts of the query or parts of the post body. Um, so that's another bit of bookkeeping that if you end up looking at this code, you'll see. Um, and sort of most significantly, um, with printf, when we apply it to a format, we get back a multi-argument function potentially, right? When we applied it to D percent s, we got back a function from integer to string to IO. Um, the routing doesn't work that way. Instead, when you apply, you know, when you have this error operator, you apply a pattern to a handler, or you apply the pattern, you get back a function that expects one argument, which is the handler function. And the handler function itself has many arguments. And that changes a few things. The most significant is that sort of the, comp the composition operator, the way they are put together, um, in here was plus plus, um, and in this is function composition, um, and so that makes, it, there's a little bit more sort of type juggling and thinking about how things work. Um, but overall, um, it's essentially the exact same mechanism. Um, and lastly, I wanted to say this is not the only way you can do this kind of really neat routing. Um, you can definitely do this with lots more types. Um, uh, you can use type families, which are essentially type level functions um, in order to construct, you, you um, make, get the patterns into the type level so they are types. So instead of the problem at the beginning was we have these value lists and we want to then have match that against a type. And if you instead say, oh, actually, we're only going to have type level lists, then you can write a type level function <laughs> into uh, a handler function. And that'll all work out. Um, this is what Spock, the web framework Spock does. They have safe routing. It's sort of the same mechanism. Um, it's, there's a lot more going on because they have type vectors and uh, all sorts of other stuff. Um, and um, another approach you can do um, is essentially define a little language for um, patterns and then define a little, a, a type, essentially a typed DSL for patterns, domain-specific language. Um, and then you essentially write an interpreter for that that consumes a URL or a request as it walks through 
and uh, matches um, as it's running. I think this needs GADT. It's the only place I've seen it done, which are uh, an extension that Haskell has and OCaml has, um, but are, again, a little bit more uh, type support that you need. Um, and this is a blog post. Someone implemented this OCaml. Um, they did this based on, I think, a, some paper thing written by Oleg. Um, uh, the, the thing that I think is interesting, aside from that, it lets you um, do some, sort of get some familiarity with continuations, which are a really useful programming technique. Um, this obviously also does not require anything, any more sophisticated type stuff. And I think I, I originally, um, I wrote one version of this a bunch of years ago, or a couple of years ago, maybe three, uh, in OCaml before the IGDTs and was able to do that. And I can port it over to Haskell, it works great. Um, and there's sort of nothing else you need um, to get this kind of stuff. Um, I think that's all I have. Um, uh, I originally figured this out because I wanted um, URL parsing, but um, afterwards I was looking for other examples um, and found this wonderful tiny little paper um, that implements this printf. Um, sort of it's saying, everyone thinks you need dependent types to do printf, you actually don't, you can do this with these you know, neat combinators. Um, so it's sort of fun if people are interested in that kind of stuff. Um, and the slides are down here. Um, that's all I have. Um, if people have questions, um, I think Libby, you want to come up. So if you have questions from either, either talk, um, either topic, or if you're just curious about other things about FN, someone had asked like why write this. Um, people are still interested in that after this. Um, ask it again. Um, we can talk about it. Um, sure. Um, Someone else maybe could have a counter argument. But I don't think there's anything monadic about it. You can do it in languages that don't have monads, that don't have higher kind of types. Um, so you can, there is a continuation monad that basically takes continuations and puts them into a monad. Um, but I don't, as far as I know, um, there's nothing inherently monadic about it. Um, I mean, to be honest, I'm not totally sure, um, but I will say that uh, the parsing library, Auto Parsec, um, uses continuations for performance because you don't end up, you have, there's no data types, there's nothing you're unpacking and packing back up, you're not boxing and unboxing, you end up with just functions. And they're just functions that get applied straight through um, depending on how the compiler can optimize them. They're functions that never return because they always just pack, pass the continuation. And continuations in, in the past have been an optimization technique or a compilation technique because you don't actually need a stack. Everything is a tail call. Um, so I would, I would be surprised if there was a huge performance hit. I don't know. Um, so we have in sort of very early stages. Um, and I don't think any of our patterns have had more than you know, five to ten things thus far. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, for, well, web frameworks are fun. Um, I think there are really two two concrete reasons for it. Um, one is. Uh, I really wanted this kind of routing um, in a framework. I wanted it to be composable, as in you can route some, you can do some um, code, and you can keep routing, and sort of that nesting works. Um, that possibly could have, I could have uh, gotten Spock to work for me, because um, they do some of this stuff. Um, I think the, the bigger reason, um, and Libby sort of uh, danced around this <laughs> at the beginning, um, is uh, I wanted to see if it would be possible and, and useful to have, to do this without a Monad transformer stack. Um, every handler is just an IO action. Um, there is a, a context data type. There's some stuff you might need, um, but there's really nothing else floating around. There's no control flow, there's no state T, reader T, logger, monads, anything else. It's just IO, and I think that uh, 
lends itself to making it very easy to sort of stick this in various other places. Um, if you want to fork things and run stuff in other threads, it's really simple because they're just IO actions. Um, and also from a, from a beginner learning perspective, uh, you don't have to understand any of that stuff. If you understand IO and functions, you can pretty much get started. Um, Uh, sure, um, if you put yourself in a reader T, every time you want to run IO, you have to call lift. So it, there's a little bit of like, you're, gonna, you're adding boilerplate whenever you want to talk to other libraries. If you want to do a normal IO thing and you're in a reader T IO of whatever, then you, you have to lift or lift IO to get your IO action. So you're adding boilerplate every time you want to do normal IO. And we're adding boilerplate every time you do um, want to call web handlers. And so the, the pressure is towards writing things that don't need this whole pile of context because it makes it harder. Like if you want to do the simplest thing, just write an IO function or write, write a pure function. Um, so I think we can probably take this offline because I want, I want other people to be able to talk. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, it's funny. Um, it wasn't the intentional of the name. It wasn't the intention of the name, um, but it definitely was the intention of the goal. That really writing this feels like writing normal Haskell. Um, you sort of you don't you don't enter into the web world. Um, you're just writing Haskell functions, um, and if they happen to need something, then you pass it to them, and that's that's it. Um, and obviously, like we use monads, we use monad transformers. We use them when we actually need them. So say you're going to do a sequence of things and you need to look up or change things or you want to early return or you want to short circuit. We do that, but you can build those. You don't have to say, my entire world is now going to be in this um, stack. That's it. Um, not a huge, yeah, I mean, I think for the most part, um, I would say it's relatively complete. Um, really, the goal is to have it be very, very small. Um, I mean, I think honest, you know, if if Scotty had this rowdy and didn't have Scotty T, I would have just used Scotty. Um, the goal is not for this to expand. I'm hoping that we don't need lots of libraries to connect it with all these other things. I'm hoping you can just use the libraries themselves. Um, and really, it's just a way to use to write a web handler that ha helps you do routing, which is sort of a fundamental thing. And that's about it. Um, a little bit of uh, bookkeeping to sort of pass things around for you, but um, yeah. I sort of am happy if other people want to do the heavy lifting and like write the web servers and write the libraries for forms and write the libraries for template and all that other stuff. If we can just sort of have just this little part, um, we'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, Daniel and uh, Libby.